Hi everybody, it's Miss Hamill here with your eighth video. This one's all about evolution. There are a lot of different goals that you need to know, so we're gonna start right now. So the theory of evolution by natural selection was actually um, developed by multiple scientists at the same time. Lamarck had a theory of use and disuse. So he knew that organisms were changing over time, but he didn't really know how this occurred. So his theory was use and disuse. If you don't use a part of you, you will lose it. So for example, snakes did not have legs. They mustn't have used their legs, so they lost them. Um, inheritance by acquired traits means that organisms obtain a trait during their life. So for example, large muscles, and the offsprings will be born with that trait. So for example, if I was um, a bodybuilder and I have huge muscles like I do, that means my offspring then would inherit the large muscles that I have developed throughout my lifetime. Of course, this is not true, so this theory is no longer accepted. However, the theory that is accepted is Darwin's descent with modification. And this states that organisms come from a common ancestor. And as we know, organisms will share a common ancestor. So natural selection um, will occur, and that is a change of the species in their um, phenotype in order to survive and reproduce. So all organisms produce more offsprings than can survive. So there has to be an overproduction of a population. All organisms, or I'm sorry, all offsprings are genetically varied, meaning that there are more than one phenotype within the population. Variations in the gene will enable some offspring to outcompete others. So for example, if we had a population of insects, um, red and green beetles, and they, their habitat was in a leaf or on a leaf, the green be beetles are going to be able to survive better in their habitat, in their environment, than the red beetles because they are not camouflaged. So the birds will eat the red beetles and the green beetles will survive and reproduce. So again, those with negative traits die and those with positive traits will survive, reproduce, and pass those positive traits on to their offspring. Eventually, the entire population will evolve and the changes happen gradually over time. So what evolution really is, is a change in a population over time. So there are different types of natural selection. We're gonna talk about three of the types of natural selection. We have directional selection, and this is when the population moves from one extreme phenotype to the other. So for example, if we had the, let's say we had small, medium, and large beaks in a bird, so all of the organisms will have large beaks, or all of the organisms will have small beaks. This disrupting selection or disruptive or diversifying selection states that the extreme phenotypes, so the ones on the end, are going to survive and reproduce while the middle phenotypes will die off. And that's the last graph. And then finally, stabilizing selection means that the average phenotypes or the phenotypes in the middle would survive or they're favored. So again, if we had large, medium, and small, the large and small would die off and the medium would survive. Um, an example of this real life example would be trees or plants, I'm sorry. Um, so the small short plants, they die off because they aren't getting enough light. The tall plants will die off because of wind, so therefore the medium plants will survive. So real life examples of shifting of phenotypes would be in the peppered moss during the Industrial Revolution. So they shift from a light to the dark color um, during the Industrial Revolution. So here we have our trees. Um, they were a nice white color and the white moss would blend into the tree and the dark moss would get eaten. So if you see this picture, you can barely see where the white moth is, but the black moth sticks out very easily. Then, over time, the Industrial Revolution that was releasing a lot of um, pollution and carbon, and it was causing the trees to become a darker color, so the light moss would now stick out and they would get eaten, 
and the dark moss would blend in and survive. So the phenotypes would shift. The populations went from having a lot of white moths before the Industrial Revolutions to a lot of dark moths after the Industrial Revolution. So this change of the moth population is evolution of the moth population changing over time. So there are different patterns of evolution. We have what's called adaptive radiation. And this is um, what was seen with the finches on the Galapagos Islands. So many species evolve from a common ancestor. So the, the finches were all related. They had a common ancestor. And their beaks were evolved based on the type of food that was available for them. So the, the feet, beaks fit the food availability. Co-evolution is that two species evolve in response to each other, so a fast cheetah and a faster gazelle, or the claw of the crab and then the, the snail that was getting a spikier shell. So they are both evolving at the same time. Then we have convergent evolution, and this is when two species evolve, but they have similar trait because they live in a similar environment. So the Madagascar aye-aye, the New Guinea striped opossum, they both have elongated middle finger for digging out bugs and trees, but they live in different parts of the world. However, their habitats are much similar. So the emu and ostrich is another good example of that. So the rates of evolution, how fast it occurs, there's two separate um, theories and two different models. We have what's called gradualism, and this is a slow, small, gradual change. The traits remain unchanged for millions of years, and then they will evolve. Punctuated equilibrium is abrupt transition, so things change rapidly. Um, rapid spurts of genetic change and that cause the divergence of the organisms quite quickly and you can see this in the fossil record. So gradualism is slow, punctuated equilibrium is much faster. So what are some of the current trends in evolution? It is, is it still occurring today? And the answer is yes. So disease resistance and pesticide re resistance, bacteria are becoming resistant to the antibiotics we use because of the misuse of antibiotics. So the bacteria are building up resistance. Basically what happens is the organisms that are resistant to the back or antibiotics, they don't die off, they'll build up and that population will increase. So the organisms with the gene for the resistance have a higher population than those that um, are die off because of the antibiotics and therefore we have the antibiotic resistant bacteria and it's very hard to kill them. Um, insects are doing the same thing with pesticides. The, you can see here, um, the green beetles or bugs, whatever type of insect is on this leaf, the green insects are killed off by the pesticides. However, the red ones survive. They have a gene that enables them to survive. So after many times or many sprays, they are res um, pesticide resistant and the red insect population will increase. So organisms that have more general needs um, typically survive and species that require specific food or habitat that becomes less available um, are more likely to die off. Artificial selection is going to be human-induced evolution, so genetically modified food, selective breeding of dogs and plants. Um, this helps um, really to produce the traits in the organisms that we want to see. So some of the evidence for evolution include fossils. If you look at um, fossils down in the layers of the earth, you can see change over time. The deeper the fossil, the older that the organism was. Biogeography, you can compare the locations of the organisms to find common ancestors. This is, um, can basically be done with the organisms that are alive today as well as by using fossils. And then we have what's called homology, and this is a similarity within organisms. So homologous structures are going to be structures that have very similar um, form, 
but they may function a little bit differently. So for example, a human arm, a cat arm or leg, a whale flipper, and a bat wing, we all have the same bone structure. We have the same bones. They may be shaped differently, but they are the same basic bones. Um, and this shows a common ancestor. Molecular similarities, we all have the same or very similar DNA. Um, many organisms have very, very similar DNA. The closer the DNA sequences, the closer the organism is related. We are about 99.9% .9 similar DNA to a chimpanzee. Vestigial structure would be a part of our body that no longer have a function. For example, our appendix, our wisdom teeth, but they may have had a function in the ancestor to help them survive and reproduce in the past. And embryological evidence, when we look at embryos, though they look very, very similar from organism to organism, from a turtle to a human to a frog to a bird. We're all very, very similar in the embryonic stage. So there's some DNA evidence there. So a cladogram is basically a, a, a graphic that shows evolutionary relationships like a family tree. Organisms that are on the same branch are more closely related. The further apart the organism, the further they are in relation. So for example, if we look at, at this cladogram for hominids, hominids are organisms like us. Um, we can see that the two organisms that are most closely related are going to be on the same branch, which would be the chimpanzee and bonobo. So these two here, you can see if, yeah, you can see that they're on the same branch. Which two organisms are least closely related? Again, it would be the organisms that are furthest apart, and that would be the gibbon and the human. Whoops. Okay, so the dichotomous key, as you remember from the alien lab that we did in class, um, it's basically a tool used to identify unknown organism using a series of steps to identify the organism, starting with the most general traits and ending with the most specific traits. So if, here's an example of a cladogram here, and it's just using the beaks of the bird to identify their common, or their common names, or their actually their um, scientific names, which are Latin. So finally, we are going to talk about the classification of organisms. So we have our prokaryotic organisms, which are organisms that have no nuclei, they have no membrane-bound organelles, and we have our eukaryotes, which are eukaryotic organisms, they have a nucleus, and they have membrane-bound organelles. So of our prokaryotes, we have are domain archaea and domain bacteria and under our eukaryotes we have our domain eukarya. So the domain is a large group of the organism so it's a um, very broad and then we have our kingdoms and the kingdoms are under the prokaryotes are archaea and eubacteria and under the eukaryotes we have protista, plantae, fungi, and animalia. So again, um, I'm just going to read down the columns and tell you some of the facts about each um, kingdom. So the kingdom Archaea includes extreme bacteria, so they're called extremophiles. They prefer to live in salty, hot, high pH environments, um, most likely the first life on Earth. Eubacteria are common bacteria. They prefer normal, warm, moist environment. They are the most numerous thing on Earth. So they pretty much live everywhere. Um, then we have Eukarya, our protista. They're mostly unicellular. There are some multicellular. They have cell walls made of cellulose and some like our algae. They can be like animals. They can be like plants. They can be like fungi. They are either autotrophic or heterotrophic. The kingdom plantae includes multicellular organisms that are autotrophic. They have a cell wall made of cellulose. They have chloroplasts that photosynthesize, making them autotrophic. So they make their own food. Then we have our kingdom fungi. They are mostly unis multicellular, I'm sorry, except for the unicellular yeast. They have cell walls made of chitin. 
They are heterotrophic. They absorb their nutrients through decaying organisms. And then we have our kingdom animalia. They are multi